church tonight, and hopefully you've been blessed already. My heart's already been blessed, and, and uh, sometimes that happens. I, I'm back there singing with the choir, and uh, you know what? You're out there back there singing. You should, I'm getting blessed too, just thinking about the words that I'm singing and how great our God is and, and how He guides us through stormy times in our life, and hopefully you've been blessed already by the music and uh, the worship together already, and, and uh, the shaking of hands, I enjoy doing that too. I enjoy uh, hugging people and shaking their hands, and because I love you guys, and uh, I enjoy being with you, and I'm glad we're together here tonight for church. And uh, let's, uh, we're going to start off, and uh, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 22, Proverbs chapter 22 tonight. We're going to look tonight at uh, a uh, very commonly used verse in the Word of God when it comes to the subject of parenting. It's actually one of the most controversial verses as well when it comes to parenting, as you see for a little bit. And, and, uh, tonight we're going to look at uh, maybe what this verse might mean and what some other people, so what, what, there's many people, they kind of, many different interpretations of this verse. We're going to look at many of those different options and, and I'm just going to be honest with you up front that I really don't know for sure what exactly, uh, but I won't say that. There's a many different ways. It's a, real, it's a lot of controversy surrounding this verse, but I do believe there's some, there are some principles that for sure are in this verse. We're going to look at those things and I think it, could be revolutionary to our uh, parenting, really helpful tonight to our homes and uh, to our parents. And uh, I want to uh, be a blessing tonight. Hopefully the Lord will speak um, to your heart as we uh, study this verse together tonight. Proverbs 22.6 says this. We could probably quote it, couldn't we? Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Let's read it again. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Like I mentioned, this verse is a verse of controversy. It brings pain to some parents and families. It brings hope to some. It brings pride to some, actually. Depending on how your kids have turned out or where you're at in child raising is basically your interpretation of uh, this verse. And it's interpreted in a variety of ways, and usually one's interpretation depends on their situation in life, as we'll get to in a second. I tell you, the most common uh, used I, I've seen, exactly at least for me in my case, the way I've heard this verse the most, um, and the way I, I, I've, I've read it the most and looked at it the most, is, is, is many people I've heard use it as an absolute promise. They use this verse as an absolute promise, a guarantee. They use it as a guarantee. And what happens with this verse, is, we'll see it many times, that's the way it's, I've heard it growing up. As a guarantee to, if you train your children right, they will turn out right. That's the way I've heard it most of my life, and I've, and if I've read it myself that way. But, but I, I, the more I've been studying, the more I... I, I Wondering if that's really, truly the case. And we'll look at that. See, the problem is it brings uh, pain and guilt to the parents whose kids are in rebellion right now. Because obviously, they didn't parent very well. That's, if the verse really means that train them up in the way they should go, and when they old, they won't depart from it. If my kids grow up and they rebel against God, it's my fault. That's a scary thing, isn't it? See, it brings pain to those who, and guilt to those parents and puts heavy loads of pain and guilt on their back because of if it's an absolute promise. It brings hope to the ones who believe that this, this, is, a, this is a promise from God and eventually their kids will come back to God. There's some hope to that. Although the question always lingers in their mind, did I really raise them up the best did I really raise them up in the way they should go? Because there's always that doubt, the question, because they know they weren't perfect parents. And they wonder, did I do a good enough job so this promise will actually come to pass? And there's always a little bit of doubt in their mind, even though there's hope that their kids will come back to God. See, this verse, if it's an absolute promise, it brings pride to the parents whose adult children are living right. If, if, they're, if your adult children are living right today, it puts a little pride in your heart to think, hey, I did a good job, I'm a great parent. And it puts a little pride in your heart. The thing is, though, is they're living right at the current moment. But who knows when that secret sin that might be in their heart is exposed. 
and their world and their life come crashing down and they lose their marriage and they lose their children and they lose their home and they walk away from God. Then all of a sudden are those parents which were writing all the great best-selling parenting books because their, parents, because their kids turned out so great, all of a sudden now are they failures as parents? See, there's a lot of questions that come to this verse if we interpret it as an absolute promise from the Word of God. It also brings pride to the hearts of the elementary school children or parents of elementary school kids who their kids are great and their kids are just pictures of obedience and great mannered. And then a lot of you parents who have teenagers or have had teenagers or raised kids all the way through, you look at those parents and you say, oh, wait till you see what's coming when they turn into teenagers. See, when you have young children, you think you're doing a great job, parent, but are you really? See, but there's hope there and there's pride there in their lives as well. See, the question comes down to this, and this is where I believe the crux of the matter is, is right here in this situation, this question right here. See, the question is, does teaching, modeling, and discipling, which what we should be doing as parents, we should be instructing them and teaching them the truth so they can understand. We should be modeling the Christian life. As, as I was talking just right before the service, and, and somebody said, hey, uh, the Christian life, or it's better caught than taught, right? We all know that's true. Parents, we have to model the Christian life. We have to instruct them. We have to disciple or discipline them and so to make sure they respond to authority. Do those things, do raising up a child in the way he should go, uh, modeling and, and instructing and disciplining, does that produce salvation in a child? Does that produce sanctification in a child? Does that produce faithfulness in a child? Does that produce fruit in an adult child? See, we won't find anywhere in Scripture or anywhere else in Scripture where there's an inclination of a promise that if you train up a child and set them in the right direction, they will. You are guaranteed a good result. You are guaranteed a good action. You won't find it anywhere else in the Word of God except in this verse right here. See, I personally used to think that only bad parents rejected this interpretation as an excuse for their kids not turning out right. But see, I think there's another principle. What if there's another option? If it's not just an absolute promise, this verse, that if you train your kids up in the way they should go, that they will not depart from it. If it's not that, though, what is, are there another option? Well, there is actually another option. What if it's not a promise? What if it's a principle? What if it's a principle from the Word of God? What if Proverbs was as it said it was and was Proverbs or principles? See, and that's what I want to talk about it for a few minutes is the fact that this might be a general principle. This verse might be a general principle. And actually, in my studies, I found this is a little more common than I thought actually at first. And some, some Bible scholars, they, here's what they had to say. Uh, one of them is John MacArthur. He's a, uh, he's a true Bible scholar. And I, I love reading things he's written. And I just... Always biblical, always good. Here's what he had to say about the book of Proverbs. Yeah, I found it interesting. I'd never thought of this before. Proverbs are divine guidelines and wise observations teaching underlying principles which are not always inflex, uh, which, which are not always inflexible laws or absolute promises. These expressions of general truth generally do have exceptions due to the uncertainty of life and unpredictable behavior of fallen man. See, John MacArthur said, hey, what if the Proverbs weren't all just truth, and not, not, not that they're not truth, but they're not absolute promises. What if they're general principles? That if you do A and you do B, you're probably going to get C. I wonder. Another, another, the another uh, theologian, uh, a really real good scholar, is John Piper. He said this, he said, the nature of the book of Proverbs is not such that is meant to give promises without exceptions. Again, saying the same thing, if, that it's, if these are principles. Another one, Warren Wearsby, you, you've probably read his commentaries, and another great uh, scholar of the Word of God. And he said, uh, like the other, and this, actually this is a comment on this verse of Proverbs 22, 6. He said, like the other Proverbs, it's not making, uh, it's not making an ironclad uh, guarantee but is laying down a general principle. Laying down a general principle. 
See, there's, I believe, a lot of reasoning for this opinion. I can see where they come for this opinion now as I've been studying this verse and as I've been looking uh, deeply into the book of Proverbs and, and looking to see what the Word of God has to say. And something I always know that when you come to the Word of God and you're trying to understand the Word of God and what a verse means, context is always critical. You always have to look at the context in the Word of God when you're reading and when you're studying. You know, you can take a single verse out of the Word of God and you can make it say anything you want. The thing is, you have to look at the context and say, well, what does the other verses around this verse say? What does the whole Bible have to say about this subject? And we have to take the whole Bible into account in the context. We can't just interpret one verse uh, out of context and just interpret it alone. We have to look at the whole Word of God together. We can look at another example is the book of Ecclesiastes, which was also written by Solomon, like Proverbs was. If you go and look at the book of Ecclesiastes, if you study the book of Ecclesiastes, there's a lot of great stuff. Uh, this last year, we taught the, I talked through the, on Wednesday nights to teenagers, I talked to, through that book to the teenagers, because it has a lot of good application for life. But you know what? The book of Ecclesiastes is a man's opinion on life. And actually, God allows the book of Ecclesiastes to show some wrong opinions of life. And we see Solomon's progression through as he, or as he analyzes life as he sees it. And he makes a lot of uh, false statements and, and, and not accurate statements as, we're, as he is in looking at life. That's why you have to interpret the Word of God as a whole. In fact, in Ecclesiastes, there's one verse. This is, ladies, you won't like this verse. This is why you can't interpret the Bible in one place. In chapter 7, Ecclesiastes, it says, I, I never forget this verse. Somebody showed it to me when I was little, and, and uh, I thought it was funny then. Now I think it's, it's uh, they were using it for a wrong way. And, uh, and now I take offense to it. But it says, it says, I find more bitter than death, the woman. It was a guy who showed me. He didn't really like women for some reason. And he, another, he, Solomon goes on. He looks. He says, I've looked and looked for a faithful man, and I've found one, but a woman I've not found. So should we use that example to say there's not a faithful woman on this earth? No. All of us who had faithful moms, we better not agree with that. We better, uh, uh, see, it's Solomon's view of the world at that moment. And he goes on to explain the truth of it later. See, you can't take one verse out of context and make it mean something because you're going to get a whole bunch of crazy truth. So the book of Ecclesiastes is an example. And, and actually right here in this passage, in, in Proverbs 22, I want to show you a verse. Uh, look at verse 4. Look at verse 4. If we say that these are all absolute guarantees, look at verse 4. By humility and the fear of the Lord are what? Riches. And, uh, and honor and life. So here he's saying in verse 4 that humility and fear of the Lord are riches. How many of you have ever met somebody who's humble, humble, good person, but doesn't have very much riches in this world? <laughs> have you ever found that? I have. I have. But that doesn't make sense according to this verse, right? See, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. See, these aren't guarantees. These are, some of these are general principles. Now, I will stop and say this. If you take a verse uh, that, that, that's backed up somewhere else in the Bible, there's other ones like, a, like a Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. We use all these all the time. I used to sing them as a song growing up. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not in thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct our paths. So is that not a truth? Is that an absolute guarantee? Actually, that is an absolute guarantee. Because you find all throughout the Word of God where it says, if you trust in the Lord, if you follow the Lord of God, if you pursue the Lord, He will direct your path and He'll lead you in the way that everlasting. But it's backed up many other places in the Word of God. See, Proverbs 22.6, is you never find anywhere else in the Bible a promise like this implies here, right here in this, in this spot, here in the Word of God. And that's why we have to look at it and see, is this really what it's saying? I'll read you a verse in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 4. I read this actually yesterday um, in my Bible reading, and if I knew what I was preaching, it hit me. I was like, this, this is another example. Jeremiah 9, 4 says, Take ye heed every one of his neighbor, and trust ye not, and trust ye not in any brother. For every brother will utterly supplant, and every neighbor will walk with slanders. So should we never trust the neighbor? Should we never trust our brother? If you take that verse by itself, it sure looks like it, doesn't it? But of course, that's not what the Word of God tells us. It's just in this context, though, this verse works. But 
it's not a truth that we should preach as a, as, as, in that way. So we have to be careful in our interpretation of the Word of God. See, and like I said, I, I'm, I'll show you, and I'm going to tell you tonight what, what the Word of God teaches here in, 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 best, of, uh, in best of my uh, study. And, uh, and I, I promise I've been as diligent as I can be in studying this and, and, and trying as best I can to be faithful to the Word of God. But I am showing you there are differences of opinion on this verse. Because I want to be honest with you tonight. And, uh, and uh, this is one of those difficult passages. Uh, but tonight I want to show you the, where I believe the Word of God does teach and what I, what I believe it does teach. See, uh, there, is, uh, there is in no place that appears a guarantee that good parenting will 100% produce godly, faithful children other than what this verse says. And we have to be careful with that. And see, I can't make myself agree that this verse is a guarantee that teaching, modeling, and disciplining will automatically produce salvation, sanctification, faithfulness, and fruit in an adult life because you don't see that anywhere else in Scripture. In fact, that could eliminate grace completely. If, parents, it were all on our shoulders for how our kids turn out. But as we'll see, that's not the case at all. I will say, though, this, this is also true, that the converse of this verse is more, I believe, a guarantee than the way you, we usually would interpret it. And actually, there's some who believe that this is the real truth of this verse. See, some believe that when it says that to, to uh, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it, many believe that this verse is a threat to parents. Who to train, who would train their children. Now, let me say this. Whenever everything parents we do as we raise our children, we are training them, good or bad. The, the, the parent who's not even in the home, who's never seen their children in their, in their life, and the other parent is raising them up. That parent who's never seen that child, that parent is training their child, whether they know it or not. They're training their child that their dad cannot be dependable and their dad is a despicable person because they've never seen him before. That's what they're training. See, you're training your child no matter what you're doing. You are training one way or the other, good or bad. And see, today, it could be a threat for parents that if you let your child, if you're training them in the way that they should go, if the way that they and their flesh and their mind want to go, if you let them go in the direction their flesh wants to take them, that when they're old, they're not going to depart from it. <laughs> and I can agree. All this world is filled with children who've turned into adults who were never taught that there's a God. And they were never taught to obey authority. And they were never taught that there were absolutes in life, which is the Word of God. And today they are living out a life completely apart from the Word of God, a completely apart from God. And there's no desire in their heart to turn to the Lord. Today, parents, this could be a threat to us, that we better do our best to give them a chance. Because if we never introduce them to the Word of God, it is going to be completely by the grace of God that they ever get saved or they ever turn to the Lord and live a productive, godly life. Now, let's look at a few reasons tonight as we started. Uh, reasons why, I don't believe that this verse is a promise. I believe it's more of a general principle. And we're going to look at some reasons why I believe this uh, tonight. The first one is this, and you'll agree with me. Parents are not perfect. Parents, we might not want to admit that sometimes. And I tell you, sometimes it stinks to have to go to my daughters and look at Megan or look at Maddie or look at Luke and say, your dad was wrong. I'm sorry. I had to do it before. Parents, here's the thing. We are not perfect. We are not perfect. In my heart, I want to be perfect for my kids, but I will never be perfect because I have my flesh. And it's warring against my spirit. Who wants to do right? And my flesh will always get in the way. And I will never be a perfect parent. And there's probably no parent who can honestly, from their from a pure heart, stand and say that they surely have trained their children perfectly in the way they should go. I'll be the first to admit, I have not trained my children perfectly in the way they should go in following the Lord. I have not perfectly trained them up in the way they truly should go. I've been a bad example at times. 
There's times when I should have instructed them something. I had an open window to teach them a truth based on something that had happened. But I was too tired and I didn't do it. There's too many nights where I didn't go pray with my kids before they went to bed. Or, or, or show them a Bible principle before they, went to bre- before they went to bed. I have not been a perfect parent. So how can I go to this verse and say, hey, that they're going to turn out right based on my parenting? Because I'm not perfect. See, the problem is, is I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, and we cannot expect our children to turn out perfectly based upon imperfect parenting, apart from the grace of God, apart from the grace of God. One thing I will say, though, to children and to adults tonight is this. Really, this applies to all of us. Sometimes we focus on all of our parents' mistakes, don't we? I've been guilty of it before. As an adult... Looking back and saying, man, I, my mom and dad, they messed up here, they messed up here, they messed up here. Here, you know what? God don't care. He does, but that's not to me to worry about. I need to look back and say, praise God that my parents raised me in a Christian home. And I need to praise God that they brought me to church and I, I was drugged to church from a baby. I was drugged to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I, they brought me faithfully to church. They taught me. They, they, as one of the greatest things about my parents, I believe, is they instructed us, especially in our early years, and they were great, unbelievable models for me. In fact, I'll use some examples. One of my brothers, he was a very, very strong-willed child. The doctors wanted to put him on the, all the, you know, the ADD medicine, all that stuff. My mom, she just wouldn't do it. She just didn't feel right about it. She just, I, I don't know, the way she described it, she just felt, and she stayed on him and stayed on him and stayed on him. And did an amazing job with a very difficult child. I need to think back on that and praise God for my parents. That they stayed married. And that they were faithful to the word of God and faithful to me as a child. And children, don't look on the mistakes of your parents. But focus on the good things that they've done and praise God for what you have. Hey, if you're here tonight, if your parents brought you here tonight to church, you need to praise the Lord. Because they care for you and they love you and they're leading you to to the Lord. Second reason why I, I believe that this isn't a promise tonight is this, is children have a choice. Children have a choice. See, if Proverbs 22.6 is a guarantee, then I already said this, but every rebellious person is the fault of a bad parent. Then I wonder this, if that's the case, then why is there an inconsistency in Scripture in punishing parents? You look at Adam. Adam, the very first father. He started off with two boys, didn't he? Cain and Abel. And we all know what happened there, don't we? Cain killed his brother. Do you remember Adam being punished for the sins of his son, for training up his child wrong? How about Jacob? And Jacob, he had, a, he had a 12 sons. And, and think what they did to Joseph. How, how rotten was that? Was Jacob punished for the sins of his 11, uh, of his 11 children? What about the prodigal, as we read in the book of Luke? Was the father ever punished or, or spoken bad of for the prodigal son? Or really for the uh, He had two rebellious children, didn't he? He had one that left and one that stayed home. They were both rebellious. Was he punished for that? You never see it in the Word of God. And actually, here's an interesting thing. Who's the type of the prodigal's father? It's God. He's the prodigal's father. See, so why is there an inconsistency then when you see uh, Samuel is another one? He was not punished for the sins of his children. But then you see a guy like Eli. Eli, if you read in the word of God, the prophet, the priest, he was punished for his sins, his son's rebellion. He was punished for his son's rebellion. See, could it be that some of these parents did a good job in raising their children, but the kids made a choice to deny God and to deny their upbringing and to pursue their own direction and pursue their own wants? And to disregard God. Could that be? And could it be that there are some parents who didn't do a good job and didn't do a good they didn't even begin to try to raise their children properly, and God punished them for it, and that's why. See, I believe that this is one of the greatest reasons why this verse can never be a, a, a guarantee, because the children have a choice in the matter. See, we must be careful to never condemn good parents for their children's failures. Because the child has a choice. We need to leave the judging to God. 
Think about this too. Who was, this is not really the exact case, but who was kind of in a way the father to Adam and Eve? They sinned and walked away from God when he taught them everything they needed to know in a perfect environment, yet they walked away, didn't they? Why? Because they had a choice. Just like my kids have and just like your kids have had and have. They have a choice in the matter. I've heard this before, where parenting is compared to growing a tree. You ever heard that before, or growing a plant? I believe that this, this, this is a good analogy, but I believe it, it actually is it's, it's a pretty good reach. And for, here's the reason why. And it, let me tell you, no analogy is a perfect analogy either. Here's the reason why. See, you can make a tree grow sideways. You ever seen one of those before? You can make a tree grow sideways. You can prune it to make it tall. You can make it short. You can make it bushy. You can make it skinny. But let me tell you tonight, that tree though, that tree isn't going to pick up and walk away while you're trying to fix it, is it? No. While you're trying to prune that tree, is that tree going to grab the clippers out of your hands and say, no, you ain't trimming me ever again? Is that tree going to take the clippers and he's going to take the clippers out of your hand so you can't trim, pr uh, prune it? And he's not going to cut that line, making it, keeping it straight, is he? But our children, they can do that. And they have a choice whether they're going to rebel against the word of God, rebel against our authority, and rebel against our, their father God. They have a choice of whether they're going to rebel. A tree, you don't have a choice, does it? See, our children, they have a choice. Let me tell you that. Kids and adults tonight, we have a choice to follow God regardless of our parents' training. We are accountable for our choices tonight. Let me make that clear. We are accountable for our choices. You may have had the worst parents in the world, but God still gave them to you. And He gave you a chance to hear the truth. And tonight, you're an example of that because you're here. You're going to be accountable for your choices. Hey, take what you've got. Take the light, whether it's little or whether it's great, and give that to God and say, God, I'm going to give you everything I had. I may not have had everything growing up, but God, I want it now. Lord. God, give me some people who help my life so I can grow and get what I didn't have when I was a kid growing up. Hey, everybody can turn out right. You have a choice in the matter. Third reason why I think parents, uh, or why, uh, why, why uh, this, uh, this verse isn't a promise from the Word of God is, because this, because children are unique. Children are unique. Think about this with me. There's some kids who are easy to train and some who are very hard. There's some who are strong-willed. There's some who are more pacifist. There's some who are pleasers. There's some who are just simple-minded. and they're, they're not really, I don't hate to say the word bright, but they, they just, they, it takes a little more direction in their life. It's just the way it is. You see that in the Word of God. Every child is unique. And if you were to turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 16, verse 11 and 12, the Bible talks about Ishmael, and God tells uh, Abraham about Ishmael, how Ishmael is going to grow, and he's going to rebel, and he's going to be against every man, and every man is going to be against him. And, and we see the examples of that today with, the, uh, with, with a lot of the Arab nations. And they're constantly at war with each other and with the world. And God's promise came true. See, God knew what kind of person Ishmael was going to be. There's hard kids, there's easy kids. You know, and sometimes, here's the situation. There may be, there's some parents probably tonight, you think you may be thinking tonight that you were a failure as a parent because your kids have rebelled against God. But could it be that your kids were just really, really hard? It could be. It could be. You know, we've all seen some of those kids, haven't we? We've, some of us have raised, some of us are raising some of those kids, aren't we? I heard a story of a toddler. He was uh, two years old and could barely talk just a little bit. He was staring out the window. The mom sneaked up behind him. And he, he, she saw him muttering something under his breath. And this little toddler staring out of the window, he's saying, I've got to figure out a way to get out of here. <laughs> hey, there's some hard kids to raise, aren't there? Hey, we've seen some of those kids, haven't we? You know, there's some days where uh, I'd say I love our kids. And uh, we have some great kids, I believe it. But sometimes... It's uh, just, the, just the constant noise and the running around and the playing. It, it, just, it just sometimes gets to us, doesn't it, parents? And sometimes I've gone home and after maybe a summer day and, and uh, where Jenny's been there with all three of the kids all day and I've been here in the office and I'll come home and I'll find her. She is ready to kill somebody because she's just had enough. You've been there before, parents, haven't you? 
And, and then, so I tell her, you know, hey, why don't you go and go to the grocery, go do something, and we're going to take a break. And she comes home three, four hours later, and she finds her husband is ready to kill somebody, and, and I about lost it. Hey, we've all had those days, haven't we? We've all had those times. Sometimes we just have difficult kids. Bill Cosby said this. This is awesome. He said, I could conquer the world if I could figure out a way to mobilize 200 aggressive two-year-olds. <laughs> How many believe that's true? You know, I believe it's true. I remember my brother growing up, and I told you my brother was a little difficult as a child. He was just full of energy. I remember this story, and I remember this too a little bit, where my mom said he, she walked in the bedroom. She heard a bunch of noise and racked upstairs. He was running around in the dresser, probably about the biggest size of his pulpit, and he was about three years old. He was running circles around the top of the dresser. For just, he just kept running and kept running. He was just full of energy. Mom asked, what are you doing? He says, I'm just running. <laughs> he was just running. He had plenty of energy. He, I remember one day he, he woke up in the middle of the night at 1 a.m. And my mom and dad heard they thought somebody was breaking in the house. They snuck downstairs to find my brother trying to get out the door. He just wanted to go outside and play. He was strong-willed and he wanted to go and do what he wanted to do. And uh, see, every kid is different in every situation. Listen to this. This was, this was a great thought. And this is what kind of clued me on to this the first time. James Dobson said this in one of his books. He made this statement about hard and easy kids. He said, if you put a hard kid, a hard kid in a good family, he might turn out all right. He said, but if you put an easy kid in a bad family with bad parents, then he'll probably turn out all right. Isn't that shocking? He said, he, they did a big study on it, and that's one of those things they found. See, that tells us today that, hey, our children are unique. Each and every child is unique, and everyone has a choice, but they're all unique in the way they are, the way they're made up, and some kids are just harder to raise than others. And you put them in the best situation, and it's still going to be a struggle for them to turn out right and make the right choices because every kid is difficult. Sometimes, or there's certain kinds of kids who are difficult. See, parents can't control the temperament of their children. You cannot control the temperament of your child. And parents, if you're struggling today and you have a hard kid, hey, pray that God will give you grace and do the best you can and rise up to the occasion. Hey, God gave you that child for a reason. But hey, listen, parents today, maybe your parent, maybe your child is long and gone and they've rebelled against everything you've put into their life, but they were a hard kid. Hey, Realize that they were a hard kid. And say, hey, I did my best. And keep praying for them. But don't load guilt on your shoulders. Because your kid had a choice and every kid is different. Maybe you're saying, hey, none of my kids turned out right. Maybe you had all good, hard kids. And maybe your friends, they didn't have a lot of hard kids. You know, I found out usually the people who want to write all the parenting books are the parents who had all the easy kids to raise. <laughs> yeah. They think they're the experts. Why? Because their kids turned out they had... If parenting is a breeze. What are you talking about? Man, that was the best years, easiest years of my life. They probably didn't have a hard kid to raise. See, we need to take all these things into consideration. That's why I believe that there's, this isn't a promise from God. Another one I'll just mention briefly. Situations are all unique. You know, there's single parent homes. There's adoptions. There's Christian moms and lost dads and vice versa. There's step, step parent situations that make things a little more difficult. Hey, every situation is a unique situation, too, and has its own unique challenges. And we've got to be careful that we don't apply this verse in the wrong way and load guilt on our shoulders. Now, there's three things I just want to briefly share with you. What I believe this verse does teach us today, though, how we can use this verse to help us as parents, and what does this verse teach us tonight? First thing it says, I believe, I believe it teaches us this. That parents, we need to set the direction. Parents, we need to set the direction of our children's life. See what it says? To train up a child in the way he should go. Parents, we should train them in the way he should go. To follow the Lord. And the goal of our parenting is so that our children bring glory and honor to God with their lives. We need to set that direction and set the direction in the way that they should go into God's will for their life. We need to train them early and we need to, to make sure it sticks and to, to, to do the best we can so it sticks. 
As we all know things, when you're taught the fundamentals at an early age, it's a whole lot easier to stick them in, to keep them stick in. I was thinking about this, I was thinking of uh, sports, and we had a lot of the times we'll try this, uh, apply this to sports. I think of a basketball player named Ray Allen. He used to play with the, uh, with the, uh, uh, the Boston Celtics. He's the leading three-point shooter, to the best of my knowledge, in the NBA history. An amazing jump shot. Just a quick release, high release. I'm not much of a judge because I'm not much of a basketball player, but uh, I can see a pretty good shot when I, when I see one, though. He, he's the leading NBA shooter, or three-point shooter in the NBA. He, you know why? He was taught from his youth leagues, his stroke, his, his, his shot. And he still does it exactly the same thing. He still goes back. When he has a few off nights, he goes back to that same youth coach to help him. He was taught the fundamentals early, and it stuck. And you know, when we teach our children the right way early on, most likely it's going to stick. It's going to stick. We need to set the direction of their life early and point them to God and lead him or her there. We need to take the authority in the, in, in the home. We need to discipline them. We need to model uh, the Christian life in them and set the example personally uh, and live out the Christian life that should be in our hearts as well. Let me tell you, parents, if it's not in our hearts, they'll see it. And we need to instruct them so they understand and better believe we need to pray like that and pray like crazy. We need to set the direction for their life. And that's what I believe this verse is teaching parents. Parents, set the direction of your children's life. Point them to the Lord. Second thing I believe this verse teaches. Not only to set the direction, but to allow personality. Allow personality. When it says to train up a child in the way he should go, that could be considering the Lord. It could be the way the Lord wants, or it could be that individual child and the way he should go in the direction that God ordained and the, God, the way God made him or her. See, every different child has been given by God many different gifts, unique abilities, different personalities. We kind of already talked about that. And God has a plan for your child today. Let me hear you repeat that. God has a plan for your child. Children today, teens, even adults, God has a plan for your life. He created you for a purpose with a specific thing in mind. And he wants you to find it. And parents, it's our job to allow for personality in our parenting, to lead them in the way they should go, the way God designed for them. See, parents, we must keep our egos and our aspirations under control. We need to keep our egos and our aspirations under control. Hey, the one aspiration you can't have for them is that they serve God and they live for God and they obey this book right here. That's a good one. But when it comes to personality things, hey, we need to be careful, parents, that we're not letting our egos get in the way of what our children should be doing. See, it's far more important that we help them find their area of expertise than making them love what we do or are always wanted for them. We need to be careful that we don't get in the way, parents. See, it's not easy to keep our enthusiasm for their idea, or to keep enthusiasm for ideas that we know will be short-lived. Parents, we know how that is sometimes, don't we? Your kid says, hey, I think I want to go do this, or I want to, I want to try doing this. And we know it's not going to pan out. We know it's not going to work. But hey, it's, we need to be careful and curb our, or make sure we try to keep our enthusiasm right. Because here's the truth. I found that even if we don't believe in an idea, we need to make sure we believe in our child. And they need to know. They need to know that we're on their side. We're trying to help lead them toward the Lord. Hey, we need to guide and we need to help. So they're going to come up with some crazy ideas. Maybe they shouldn't even try. And we can help them with that and explain that. We need to be careful that we're not shaping them in the way we want them to go, specifically to our personality or what we think. We need to make sure that we're shaping them in the way God designed them, God made them, and what God wants for their life. And parents, we should gain insight into that. And last thing I want to leave with you tonight is this. Three things this thing, this verse teaches, I believe, is set the direction, parents, to allow personality, and lastly, to step away. To step away. See, eventually every kid will leave the home. We hope. <laughs> Sometimes we that's the goal. Is that they leave and they become independent people. And that they serve God with their lives. That's the goal. I read a story of one, uh, of one young man who his father left. and The father was passing by the teenage daughter's bedroom and was astonished to see on the bed a nicely made 
or the bed was nicely made and everything was neat and tidy. And then he saw an envelope propped up prominently on the center of the pillow. and It was addressed, Dad. With the worst premonition, he opened the envelope and read the letter with trembling hands. It said, Dear Dad, it is with great regret and sorrow that I'm writing you, but I'm leaving home. I had to elope with my new boyfriend because I wanted to avoid a scene with you and Mom. I've been finding real passion with Jim, and he is so nice to me. I know when you meet him, you'll like him too, even with all his piercings, tattoos, and motorcycle clothes. But it's only... But it's not the only, it's, it's not only the passion, Dad. She said, I'm pregnant, and Jim said that he wants me to have the kid and so that we can be happy together. Even though Jim is much older than me, anyway, 42 isn't so old these days, isn't it? And has no money. Really, these things shouldn't stand in the way of our relationship, don't you agree? Jim has a great CD collection. He already owns a trailer in the woods and has a stack of firewood that'll last all winter. It's true that he has other girlfriends as well, and I know he'll be faithful to me in his own way. He wants to have many children with me, and, and that's now one of my dreams too. In the meantime, we'll pray for science. We'll find a cure for AIDS so Jim can get better. He sure deserves it. Dad, don't worry. I'm 15 years old now, and I know how to take care of myself. Someday, I'm sure we'll come back to visit so you can get to know your grandchildren. Your loving daughter, Rosie. P.S. Dad, none of the above is true. I'm over at the neighbor's house. I just wanted to remind you that there are worse things in the world than my report card that's in the desk drawer. I love you, Dad. Please call when it's safe to come home. <laughs> you know, it's a sad thing there's some cases that are that way, aren't there? And, uh, that's not the way we want our kids to leave, is it? But one day, our kids are going to leave. And we need to do our best so that they don't leave that way when they do leave. And the sad thing is some kids won't leave, though. They'll run. Because parents wouldn't let them go. You know, one of the common causes for resentment that's found in teens is this. Parents, they say, parents won't let us make mistakes and learn. See, parents, our job as parents is not, to, is not to keep them from making mistakes, but to let them make them early enough while, we can, while they can learn from them when they're not too serious. When they're making the first decisions in their lives as a college student, oh, you better, be, you better know that they're going to make some really bad ones. And they're going to be life-altering, serious, terrible decisions. We need to be careful that we're letting them go progressively. See, ch young children, they're incapable of making complex moral decisions. And they need to be made for them. Parents, we have to take control and do that. But we need to begin re releasing them during the, the preschool years and, and granting independence that is consistent with their age and maturity. And we need to teach them that responsibility equals freedom and grant them a little bit of freedom as they get older and older and older, as they are responsible. And we need to give them that freedom so they don't feel like they're tied down and so they won't want to run. Again, that's something each individual family has to decide in which way they're going to do that. But you can do that with slowly but surely. Begin letting them make decisions in their lives. See, kids whose parents have let them suffer the consequences of their own behavior before college, who gave them freedom with boundaries, don't usually feel the need to express themselves in Because they felt like they were, uh, they were, they felt freedom all throughout their life. And they didn't feel the need to run. How do we do that? There are some ways we can do that. We need to take them places where they can have some freedom. This, uh, this weekend we did that. And uh, I was at the 4th and 5th grade camp. It's a good environment for your kids to have some freedom from you parents. In a good environment with good people. Teaching them, leading them in the right way. Helping, assisting you. Our church is a good way for that, and we do that with youth activities as well. A good environment for your kid to gain a little bit of freedom in a right way. We need to put them in the care of people we trust. We need to provide opportunities for them to test their independence as they get older. And one author said this, and this, this, this is the goal. This should be the goal of us as parents, as parents. He said, having seen our kids change from dependent children 
to independent adults so that we now enjoy a new relationship with them as peers is the most rewarding experience of our lives. That's our goal. But we've got to learn to slowly step away and let them make the decision. And truly, if we're to train them up in the way they should go, we've got to begin to step away. And slowly, gradually, as they grow and as they mature, and as they are more and more responsible, give them freedom and guide them in the right way. What's the purpose of the message tonight? The purpose of the message tonight is this. I don't want to throw good parents under the bus for the mistakes of their children. I really believe so. I believe that way. There's good parents in here whose if kids, some of the kids have turned out, or maybe all the kids have turned out. You might have done everything you could. You might have had some hard kids to raise. Another purpose, I don't want to, another purpose is I don't want to, I want to be honest with us as parents, but I don't want to ease the responsibility either in our lives, parents. We have an immense responsibility. Oh, and we better get engaged into the fight and the, for the lives of our children. But what I do want to do is I want to put a proper responsibility on the parents and on the children. Listen to this statement tonight. This is the whole message right here. Parents, we have a responsibility. But children, you have a choice. Parents, we have a responsibility to train them up in the way they should go. And children, and even adults tonight, no matter what way you were raised, you have a choice to follow God and to follow your upbringing. And parents, tonight I want to challenge you and I want to encourage you to rise to the occasion. You know, we may be imperfect. We're not going to be perfect parents. I'm not a perfect parent. Every parent here would testify and say, I have made mistakes. But we need to rise to the occasion and stand for our children. And we need to model for them the Christian life. We need to instruct them and teach them and discipline. And we may have a difficult, you may have a difficult child in your home. It may take everything. You've got all the patience that the Holy Spirit can give you to stay in the fight. But you can do it. You can do it. And invest in their lives now for the hope that they will not depart from you. Can't guarantee it. Can't guarantee it. Oh, but you can do everything you possibly can. Turn them over to God with all the prayer that you have in you. And pray. Parents, we need to set the direction. We need to allow for personality in their lives and we need to begin to step away. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. It may not be a promise. It may not be a guarantee, but hey, it's a principle that we can hold on to and we can learn from to apply to our families, to raise children, to bring glory and Father, Lord, I pray that you were glorified through this message tonight. And I pray that parents were helped and families were helped tonight. Lord, help them to make the decisions right now that they need to make. Lord, there may be some parents tonight, Lord, they, they needed encouragement tonight. I pray they found it. Lord, they know they weren't perfect, Lord, but they did the best they could. Maybe they weren't even saved while they were raising their kids, and now they are. Lord, they're just filled with grief over where their children are. Lord, I pray that you please reach all of our kids, wherever they're at today, and you turn them towards you. That you give them light, Lord. Lord, I pray for the ones that were raised right, the kids that were raised right, Lord, and Lord, help them to turn back to you if they rebel. Lord, help those of us who... We would say, look at their lives now, and we say, man, they did turn out right, Lord, but it could take just one slip, and they could fall away from everything that they've done and fall away from you, Lord, help them to live right. Lord, help us as parents to set the direction, to lead our homes, to allow for the personality of our children, Lord, to, to let them go in the way that you want them to go, the way you designed them, Lord, and, and to begin to step back, step away, giving our children independence so they can learn to make their own decisions 
choose you. Lord, bless the invitation, I pray. In Jesus' name.